no Q is going to go through that boundary, right? So there's no Q that's going to go through there. And we combust inside, say, a steel box, CH4 and oxygen. In this steel box, is the volume going to change? No, it's rigid. So what is the internal energy of this whole thing? How does the internal energy of this whole thing change? Doesn't change at all, right? So will heat be transferred from our combustion engine to the water, or a combustion box to the water? Yeah, so heat is transferred across this boundary, and that's fine, we can do that calculation, we can figure out delta T of the water based on the enthalpy of combustion of methane. Um, we can go through that if you want, but this is just a regular calorimeter question. You practice that a lot um, with Brandon and uh, with some in-class problems. But the total internal energy doesn't change. You're just sending heat back and forth from the water to the methane and oxygen. What about the universe? What is the delta S of the universe for this? For this process? <coughs> Zero. Greater than zero. Oh, is this a phase change? Chemical reaction, right? So the delta S in the universe has to be greater than zero. <coughs> so make sure you know about these types of diagrams. Make sure you know about this diagram. Make sure you know about this diagram. And make sure you can sort your way through some of these calorimeter questions and where the heat is moving in. So I'm not going to drill you on six calculations of calorimeter questions, right? But it's really easy to ask you how the internal energy changes. Go ahead. Uh, this is a little easier one, but uh, I got this right on the test. For the nurse equation, um, for N, could you just quickly go over on sure. determining what uh, N is equal to? Yep. So let's say you have copper going to copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons, and then you have nickel 2 plus plus 2 electrons goes to nickel solid. Which one's the anode? Because that's oxidation. This one then has to be the cathode. This is reduction. What's the full reaction? So these are half cells, of course. Cu plus nickel 2 plus. So these reactions balance, right? Because the electrons balance. And the N is defined as the number of electrons in the half reaction. So it's not the total number. It's not 4. N doesn't equal 4. N equals 2. Because the full reaction is balanced, so this reaction is balanced, right? Copper, copper, plus two, plus two, nickel, nickel. So this is all balanced. These two are balanced, and so N is defined as the number of electrons in the half reaction. Now, if this was my full reaction, so say I was working with two moles of copper here, I would have... these half reactions, and then the N is 4 in this case. Because remember, my half reactions have to add up. I need two coppers, and I need two nickel cations, two copper cations, two nickels. And so the half reactions have to sum directly to the full reaction, and then just the N changes if I change the stoichiometric coefficients down here. Go ahead. So if you change um, five in the, in the oxidation, if you change the oxidation to five electrons and you add an electron uh, to the products in the full reaction, that would still be five? If I put an electron like here? Here, and then you make uh, the oxidation five. This thing? Yeah, hypothetically. And that, there would be like a... Like that, yeah. Imbalance in the full, but still. Well, so... 
I need to make sure I have the same number of electrons in the half reaction. So, so this is not balanced because I would need to get 20, I mean 20 yeah. is going to be the lowest uh, number that fits both of these. So I'd have to multiply this one times 5, that one times 4, and then n would be 20. That's a little weird. But the electrons have to balance in each of my half reactions, right? In oxidation, I'm going to make electrons. In reduction, I'm going to consume electrons, and those electrons have to balance. Yeah? Does, does the electric potential change if, it, if, you have, if you double the number of the half reaction, or is it just the base electric potential? It's just the E0. So no matter, it's just the base. Uh, the base standard potential. So whatever these are, 0.2 volts or whatever, those don't change when you change the stoichiometric coefficients. Because <coughs> we talked about uh, delta G is negative NF E0, right? I don't change any of the voltages when I double the stoichiometric coefficients, but I do change N, right? And so depending on exactly what the N is, that will have an effect on delta G0 here, but you don't do any math with these other than just sum it up. Or reverse the sign, of course, if you make an oxidation into a reduction. That's good. I, that, that's a good question. <coughs> okay, so let's go back to fluorine and iodine. Which one has a higher refractive index? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So refractive index is proportional to, do we use omega? I can't remember what the symbol for polarizability is that we use. But refractive index is proportional to polarizability. So things that have higher polarizability will have higher refractive index. Also, things that have higher polarizability have higher van der Waals forces, right? So iodine's got higher van der Waals, it's got higher refractive index, and it's got higher, higher polarizability. So this is McLaughlin's rule, right? Where the polarizability uh, is related to the van der Waals forces. So things that have higher van der Waals forces uh, will have higher polarizability. What, what was the question? Oh, refractive index. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So refractive index, remember what refractive index is, is that this is the response of the material to an oscillating electric field, right? So higher refractive index things when you send in an oscillating electric field like light, iodine is going to respond more, right? So it has a higher refractive index. Fluorine is going to respond less. It's got fewer electrons. It has high electronegativity, and so the refractive index of fluorine is going to be low. So the refractive index gives you an idea about how much you can shake those electrons around when you send in this oscillating field. And so given the fluorine and iodine example, we talked about van der Waals forces, we've talked about polarizability, and now we've talked about refractive index, so we can link these things up. What about dielectric constant? Which 
molecule has higher dielectric constant? The iodine. Iodine. So that's right. So dielectric constant K, KD is higher. So things with higher polarizability have higher dielectric constant as well. Go ahead. Uh, could you go over <coughs> the types of uh, K values, like equilibrium K? And oh, yeah. All those. So remember, this is dielectric constant now, K sub D, hopefully based on the type of question I ask, you'll know the difference between dielectric constant and equilibrium constant. So K EQ, uh, let's write out a simple reaction, A goes to B plus C. Remember we have a forward rate constant, we have a reverse rate constant, so that's just the forward rate constant is A goes to B plus C. You know about first order, second order, third order. Remember you need experimental data to tell you what the order of the reaction is. You can't figure it out any other way. So this is not first order in A, and it's not second order in the reverse direction. You need data to tell you. And so we have the key graphs about how we can tell how the concentration changes as a function of time, and that tells us the order. So KEQ is K forward over KR. And so we can equate this equilibrium constant to something like K dissociation. Let's say if A is dissociating into B and C, we can call this a dissociation equilibrium constant. If A is a solid and B and C are aqueous, this can be dissolution, there can be precipitation. And so mostly all these K sub something are just special names for what type of process uh, is going on. But they're all some form of equilibrium constant and this is always true. So K equilibrium is the ratio of the forward over the reverse. You know about concentrations and how KEQ relates to Q. So hopefully you remember the reaction quotient stuff. You even got to practice it on the electrochemistry um, part of the class. Uh, and reaction orders. So, so the details of K dissociation or K solubility.